Corinthians chapter 5. Let's open with a word of prayer after I take a sip. Second Corinthians chapter 5, and let's pray. Father, as we engage in this second session of Bible study tonight, uh, we get into areas that are, are actually very deep areas in the Word of God. We pray that God the Holy Spirit would provide simplicity and, uh, and would make this session spiritually profitable uh, and practical to us. And we also pray that as we study together, we uh, may gain more insight into eternal matters, which uh, is always your will for us. We ask that this would be accomplished by means of God the Holy Spirit, and we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, Second Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for or because we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Now, in verse 1, this earthly tent, which is our house, let's consider that phrase because it is a figure of speech, of course. I don't think anyone would have a problem understanding uh, it's not a, a literal house or a literal tent, but it's a figure of speech representing the mortal physical body. So how do we reconcile this then with the known fact that we are going to receive our glorified bodies at the time of the rapture. Well, there have been uh, three basic attempts to uh, try and solve a, a problem, a supposed problem, uh, where there actually is no problem. And I'm going to read, I'm just going to uh, read some quotes from uh, this subject in the book of, of the, the book that I wrote uh, about the book of Jonah in 1996. And uh, we have, uh, first, before I go into this, we have the commonly known doctrine of soul sleep that uh, says that the believer is just unconscious uh, and usually teaches this about unbelievers as well before they go into uh, the lake of fire. But believers are just unconscious until uh, the time that we'll receive our glorified bodies at the rapture. 
because they feel like they, they have to explain that period of time. So they teach soul sleep, and of course, uh, because they do, they reject the narrative of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke chapter 16 as being a narrative. They say it's a parable. But it is not a parable. We went all, all over that first session last week. Then we have a theory that uh, some have proposed, one of them being Charles F. Baker, whose theology overall, I agree with uh, his dispensational theology, I agree with his dispensational theology more than any other dispensationalist who has ever lived. Uh, he, he's on some doctrinal subjects. He was, he was not that strong, but on his understanding of uh, this dispensation beginning in mid-Acts, beginning uh, in, in the period of, of Acts 9, uh, going in through Acts 13, that actually being the barrier, the dispensational barrier, not Pentecost. He was, he was uh, very sound on that. He was also sound on his understanding that salvation in every dispensation has always been by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And there are others who have the mid-Acts dispensation, uh, dispensational breakdown correct, but they believe that in other dispensations, uh, works were used as uh, what do they call it? An ins not an essential means, but an instrumental means. C.R. Stam believed that, and I believe he actually believed that in the different dispensations, different works were required for salvation. No, the different works were required uh, for obedience and to uh, fulfill the spiritual life during the different dispensations, but they were never a salvational issue, never. And uh, Les Feldick, who's teaching, I, I, uh, I embrace for the most part, uh, believe that under the dispensation of the law, attempting to keep the law was necessary for salvation. No. Absolutely not. It had nothing to do with salvation. David understood that. As the Apostle Paul explained in Romans chapter 4, David knew he was not saved by keeping the law. Most of Israel did not know that. Most of Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness in Romans 10, 3, uh, tried to es establish themselves before God by their own righteousness, not submitting to the righteousness of God. That's how Israel was under the law. That's how future Israel is going to be with the new temple system. When the new temple is built in the future, uh, keeping the ritual system, Israel will still be attempting to stab establish her own righteousness by keeping the law of Moses. Uh, the, things are going to pick up right after the rapture, right where they left off as far as the law of Moses goes, even though the law has been set aside forever because Christ in Romans 10, 4, fulfilled the righteousness of the law for all those who believe. Now, anyway, didn't mean to get off on a rant there, but sometimes it just happens. Sometimes I believe it actually happens as prompted by the Holy Spirit. Charles F. Baker believed this, uh, that the, the soul of the believer is temporarily disembodied. Uh, he explains, and I quote, I, he doesn't explain now because he's gone home to be with the Lord, but, uh, you know, they use the present tense. In his writings, he explained 
that uh, although the righteous dead go directly to heaven, they go in a disembodied state. This was from his great work, and it is a very great work uh, that I, I would recommend to anyone, a dispensational theology. It is a, a, a one-volume uh it's not a short book, but it covers, it's not only dealing with the dispensations, it's dealing with uh, theology, Christology, soteriology, and so forth, all the, all the subjects covered by, uh, by theological works. And uh, his book is a great read. He, he made it uh, very simple and very straightforward. But... Uh, his view on this subject is clearly refuted by 2 Corinthians 5.1, which teaches that to die physically is to possess an eternal body. And we'll get into that in more depth uh, momentarily. But let's go into another view that was proposed by Schofield and expanded upon by Lewis Perry Chafer, but it's basically the same view. Uh, Schofield suggested, C.I. Schofield, the editor of the, of the, Sco, the famous uh, Schofield edition uh, of 1917, Schofield suggested there is a body from the heavens which precedes the resurrection of the physical body at the rapture. And he wrote... At the believer's death, he is clothed upon with a house from heaven pending the resurrection of the earthly house and is at once with the Lord. And Lewis Perry Chafer went on to expand on this view. And Lewis Perry Chafer wrote in uh, volume four of his systematic theology, uh, a body from heaven, eternal with respect to its qualities as any body from heaven must be, awaits the believer who dies. He will thus not be unclothed or bodiless between death and the resurrection of that original body, uh, which will be from the grave. The body from heaven could not be the body which is from the grave, nor could the body from the grave serve as an intermediate body before the resurrection. Apart from the divine provision of an intermediate body, the believers desire that he should not be unclothed or bodiless, could not be satisfied. So, Chafer, brilliant theologian, I, w I would recommend his uh, eight-volume systematic theology to anyone as well, and he also wrote very clearly, very lucidly. Uh, he was a good read, um, but he saw a problem. We're going to see, I hope tonight, that, that the problem that he thought he saw isn't actually a problem which exists. But he thought, since there's a time lapse between uh, when a believer of this present dispensation dies and the rapture, that has to be explained by some kind of intermediate body because a body is described in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 8. So, they made up one. That's, that's, I'm not trying to be insulting, but, that, but that's what it is. They made up one. Um, so, these theories then, these three theories, soul sleep, the disembodied state, and the intermediate body, all of these contradict 1 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 1 again. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, first I want to note something that is uh, 
that really stands out to me in this is that there uh, we've gone over the the conditions that uh, particles set up when they're used with with certain moods and tenses in the Bible, the first class condition, the second class condition, the the third class condition, the first class condition being if and it is so that blah blah blah. That's the first class condition. Second class condition is if and it is not so blah 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 blah. And then the third class condition, these are all just presented uh, grammatically. It's a matter of function in the Greek language. There are different nuances with, with these, but as to the basic structure, uh, this is how it goes. The third class condition, because the particle eon is used, E-A-N in, in English transliteration, and when that's used in the first clause, which is the apodosis of, of uh, one of these phrases, if and then, and if it's used in the if clause, uh, this preposition with the subjunctive mood, the subjunctive mood makes things indefinite. It could happen, it couldn't happen. It may happen, it may not happen. Now why is this important in this verse? Because this is actually saying, for, with it, for we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, that may happen or it may not happen, then we have, now it becomes the present indicative, which is, which simply indicates the reality of the verb. If, if that happens, we have, present tense, we have a house, a, a building from God, uh, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So why is the first part of this clause iffy? Because doesn't everybody die physically? And the answer that you're probably thinking is no, they don't. Not that one generation, which Paul described in his first letter to the Corinthians, that behold, I show you a mystery. We shall, uh, we shall not all sleep, we shall not all die physically, but we shall all be changed. So Paul was recognizing by the very third condition that he was still looking forward to the rapture as, as we're still supposed to be. And he was looking forward to it in his own time, as he was supposed to be. Because it is something that we know is going to happen, but we don't know when it is going to happen. Doug Miller keeps asking me, well, give me a date. He says, he asked for a date. It's... Uh, I said that wrong. He's not asking me for a date. He's asking when the date of the raft. Okay, uh, you can take that out of the text. Uh, but I, I have no date for you, and, and Paul has no date for you for the rapture. And we can't have because it's a mystery event. We don't know when it's going to happen. Paul was looking forward to it as it might happen at any time. And he said, comfort one another with these words. And so we can't set a date on it. And it, it, this is just something Doug and I joke about because of all the, the uh, what we call the date setters out there. that have all, they, They've set a date. Oh, it's going to happen this time. And of course, it never does. And uh, I believe probably 
uh, when it does happen, it isn't going to be a time that uh, someone has said it, it is going to happen. But that's just uh, possible. It may be. I, uh, I don't know. But I'll tell you this. Uh, we don't know when it's going to happen. But that's on the timeline. But let's look at things from the eternal reality. Because remember, eternity is just as real as time is. And so when the Apostle Paul is writing in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 8, he is writing about that eternal reality we will experience right after we die physically if we are not uh, in that one generation of the rapture generation, when we physically die, we're going to be right at home with the Lord. So if, if we're of the, the vast majority of people throughout the history of the body of Christ who uh, do die before we go to heaven, immediately upon physical death, when we hit heaven, we are in that eternal body. No waiting for any kind of other body. To suggest there is a, an intermediate eternal body, as did Schofield and Chafer, is to suggest that a believer would have two eternal bodies. That does not make any sense at all. Eternity by its very nature, means without beginning and without end. In fact, it's translated that way in uh, uh, Ionas, in, in the uh, uh, Bauer, Arndt, and Greek, uh, Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich Greek lexicon as uh, without beginning and end. And it is used in a number of ways. That's why, I, like I was just speaking with Jesse, uh, it is confusing sometimes because in some contexts it does mean everlasting. But the, uh, the third heaven is eternal and the dwelling place that we are going to have is eternal face to face with the Lord, not waiting for another eternal body, because that would be saying that a believer upon physical death gets two eternal bodies. One, a temporary eternal body, which is a, a contradiction of terms, awaiting the eternal body. But let's... Um, Let's look at this. This is, uh, this is quite amazing to me uh, because I've, I've listened to and I've, during my entire uh, time of knowing the Lord, uh, which I came to understand what Christ accomplished for me on the cross uh, back in 1978 and I've read and listened to a lot of uh, J. Vernon McGee. And there is a man who was an absolute brilliant Bible teacher. And uh, some people think that just because he spoke in a he spoke and, and wrote in a manner that was forthright and plain, they think he's some kind of backwoods preacher that, that really doesn't know theology. Uh, J. Vernon McGee had a vast, vast understanding of the scriptures, including eternal matters. And he wrote on 2 Corinthians 5.1, or... Uh, Rather, this is actually radio transcripts that were, that were written down. So he said in one of his radio broadcasts, but it was written down. This verse has always been a big question mark to me. 
I've never been too dogmatic about the interpretation of it, but I have now come to the conviction that what he is talking about here is not a temporary body. For many years, I thought that he would have sort of a temporary body for us. It would be like taking your car to a garage for repair work and having a loaner to drive until it is fixed. I thought that the Lord would give us a temporary body until our new body was given to us. I never liked that idea, but it seemed to be what Paul was saying. Now, I don't believe he is referring to a temporary body because he says it is eternal in the heavens. He's talking about that new body that we are going to get. So, here is the breakdown. And it, it, it really, it's not that difficult. All we need to understand is that time is not eternity, and eternity is not time. And C.R. Stam recognized uh, what uh, uh, J. Vernon McGee saw as well. And C.R. Time said that time is not a factor in eternity when, when he was teaching this passage. Time is not a factor in eternity. What does that mean? It means that when we die physically, if we die before the rapture, we are immediately absent from the body, present with the Lord in our eternal body, being clothed in our eternal body, not being found naked, and it is the, the only eternal body we will receive. Well, you, but, but the, our immediate reaction is, but wait, the rapture is, uh, the rapture is future to many who have already died in Christ throughout church history. That this is true, but eternity is not time, and time is not eternity. So, the the only way that that perhaps. Uh, we might begin to be able to process this is to, to just think of the, the, uh, the concept of time travel. Only it's immediate time travel, travel. When we die, we immediately are in eternity face to face with the Lord in our eternal body, which is separated from time, not subject to time. What happens in time doesn't matter to what's going on in eternity. The fact that in time, it is, the rapture is going to be the mechanism by which the dead in Christ of this dispensation and the living at the time of the rapture, the living in Christ are going to receive their, their uh, glorified bodies. The fact that on the timeline, that's the point of time it's going to happen, does not matter in eternity. Eternity is not time where the earth is and the first heaven and the second heaven are. And where Hades is and where paradise was until Christ took paradise into the third heaven. But we'll, we'll be there in our eternal bodies, no matter what's going on in time. And time is going to catch up with the mechanism that gives us our eternal bodies. It's that simple. We just have to be willing to, as Paul admonished in, in the, the latter part of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we have to be willing to look at the things, not the things which are temporal in time, but the things which are eternal. 
Look at the things, not the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen, the things that are eternal, not the things that are temporal. Now, to, to illustrate that, the fact there's no separation from the rapture. I, I actually, in my book on Jonah, I had a, a another chart which illustrated it, but I brought my wide black marker, and I'm going to show you that Christ is now where? He's in the third heaven. He is with God the Father at the right hand of the Father. And so are we in our eternal position. And this is not theory. It's not abstract. It's not something that, that's just worked out on paper and is going to be a reality. It is a reality right now, but it's not a temporal reality. It's an eternal reality. But that's how, if, if you go away with anything tonight, that's that's what I'd love for it to be, because that's the, the, the newness and the freshness this has given me of, of considering things even more as I've studied it more recently to, to teach it again. It's about our identity in Christ, how solid it is. That it's not, when we think of our position in Christ, oh yeah, it's, it's the way God sees us, okay, I can understand that, and we can, we can work that out on paper through the scriptures and recognize the, the wonderful realities of our spiritual, our eternal position in Christ, but it's, it's not really, it's not real yet. Yes, it is real. It's, it's real every bit as time is real. It's just real eternity, not real time. Now, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father in eternity. And Jesus Christ, in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 16 and 17, is going to come down into the clouds of the air, which is the... The first heaven, the immediate atmosphere, it's going to be somewhere above the earth in the clouds of the air, the, the immediate atmosphere, the first heaven in time. So he's going to travel from eternity to time. And then he's going to take us and take us right back with him into the third heaven, into eternity. But that's where when the believer dies, if it's on the timeline before the rapture, that's, that's what has already happened to the believer. It's, a, it's deep, but it's, uh, it's real. It's the best way I know to explain it. Maybe some, someday I'll be able to explain it better. But, but it's all about the, the, you know, the rapture is an intervention in time. That's the mechanism whereby every member of Christ's body is going to receive their eternal body. And believers of other dispensations, it's a different mechanism in time, but they're going to, uh, once you die, you're in that eternal state. Now, now prior to uh Prior to paradise being taken into the third heaven, there was a temporal abode for believers after physical death. And yet, and, and this will be challenging to consider, but yet nevertheless, 
their eternal position was as real as ours is. Because what do you think happened in the transfiguration when Christ appeared to some of his disciples with Elijah and Moses in their glorified bodies? What do you think happened? An intervention from eternity into time. What do you think happened with the, with the pre-incarnate appearances that the Lord Jesus Christ made to Abraham and so forth? An intervention from eternity into time. No problem with God. God created time. And that's all I had to say tonight. Let's close with a word of prayer. Let me find the cap for this and put it on. Father, thank you for the understanding that you give. And sometimes the challenge to all of us that goes along with us as we, we study subjects sometimes which are designed to be challenging to us because you reward those who diligently seek you. And Father, we thank you for what you've given us tonight. We pray that as we cogitate on these things and reflect on them, meditate on them, we'll receive more clarity as we move on. And we pray very importantly that we might better understand the solidity of our position in Christ and the, the eternal reality of our real eternal position in Christ. We ask all this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.